hi everybody are you ready to go on a nature journaling adventure in the amazon we're going to start in the andes actually and work our way down to the amazon in this virtual hi adventure. everybody are you ready to go i'm on? super excited about it let me just close that instagram there and let's get going all right so i am really excited some people are already signed up for this trip but right now we're just going to do a virtual preview and you will all get to see what it's going to be like and we're going to get a sketch some stuff so make sure you have your nature journaling supplies handy i'm going to switch to my sketchbook camera here and get a blank page ready i just got back from the nature journal beach vacation in costa rica it was really fun I know some of the people that participate in that trip are here tonight, and some people who are going on the Ecuador trip are here tonight, which is really exciting. Um, yay, Jean is here, James is here, Margot is here, Linda is here, a whole bunch of people in the house. Um, thanks for joining in. And we've got some fun stuff. So if you like hummingbirds, orchids, butterflies, there's even some mammals and volcanoes mixed in. I think you're gonna like this. And we're just gonna go through the itinerary a little bit and give you the sense of going on this actual adventure. Some people do some sketching on the plane. I get motion sick, so I just uh, watch the entertaining things people around me do while I have noise canceling headphones in. But the day zero for the nature journal, uh, this nature journaling adventure in Ecuador is gonna be in Quito. and there's not that much scheduled for day zero, the arrival day. So just get your nature journaling supplies ready, get used to the altitude. If you're feeling adventurous, you could go urban sketching. Um, and for those of you who are coming on the trip, you can organize to do things with Nancy on day zero. Check out this building right here it is very, very fun to sketch. There's also an amazing orchid greenhouse in Quito and a place with a whole bunch of snakes and reptiles where you can nature journal but really day one is going to be here at the towering agave so let's start our actual nature virtual nature journaling here um, at this time so let's do a little landscape ito to kind of capture this and this is one of the things that you'll learn about if you come on the real life trip or at least get a practice a lot of people know about landscape itos already but let's just create a frame here. Luckily this is, since it's a photo, it's already framed. That helps a lot. And let's break this up into sort of a visual hierarchy. I'm going to try to keep it simple so I can do this quickly. And this agave is right here in the foreground, an extreme foreground element that overlaps a bunch of the other elements. If you've taken any of my other landscape painting classes, you know that I like those extreme foreground elements overlapping everything else. I'll make this a little bit bigger for you to see just for a second, but you can see here I've laid in the big agave in the foreground and gotten that basic frame. So let's go back to um, this right here. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually probably gonna lay in some of the other things with gray. And this is really a cool ecosystem. It's up in the Andes, but it's very dry. It's in a rain shadow. So you can go from a completely dry place with weird cacti and bromeliads, dry adapted bromeliads. You can go from a place like that to a dripping wet cloud forest in less than an hour in this part of Ecuador. And it's really cool And our first day we're gonna be checking out an ecosystem just like this. This, I took this picture, it's actually a video. I took this video at the zoo, the Quito Zoo. Technically it's still Quito. And we're gonna be going to a place like this on day one of the Andes to Amazon trip. So I've got my basic, let me make mine a little bit bigger here. I've got my basic landscape sort of layout right there that you can see. I'm trying to make it quick, keeping it, keeping it small obviously is really important. And I'm gonna probably just put in a few of the buildings. Um, that's probably the hardest part in this particular one. There's some tricks for 
quickly reproducing things, natural things, but I find it it's actually harder to simplify urban, the chaos of, of human constructions. So a lot of times trying to draw a bunch of buildings quickly, it's not as easy as trying to draw a bunch of bushes or something quickly. But I'm going to try my best and just do a bunch of these sort of squares because we're doing a quick landscape ito. Don't get out your oil paints. Don't get all Bob Ross on it. Um, this is just a quick sketch to capture the moment. Sometimes you don't have that much time. And sometimes you almost want to make it into a little bit more of a cartoon and simplify it. So you can see a little bit of what I got there. And I'm going to put in color too. So hopefully you all are painting along. This is a, a virtual adventure so that you can join in as well. And on each, each element, I'll talk about uh, that part of the, the actual nature journaling adventure that's going to be next year in the summer. So I'm going to start with my blue. I'm going to go for cobalt blue. And you'll notice the sky is not really um, that dark at all. It's never that dark. In fact, it's usually or almost always the lightest element in the entire landscape like that's way too dark right there that's probably a lot more realistic and you can barely see any color to it at all but that's actually how it is and what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this blue down not into the clouds but into the furthest away part of the land the background because a lot of times there is some blue in there Yay, Eve is here too. Terry is here. Gene, um, Drew Rosales is here. Good crew of people in the in the house tonight. Happy holidays. Happy solstice. We are going on a virtual nature journaling adventure along the route that we will be taking next summer with a select group of nature journalers um, in Ecuador from the Andes to the Amazon. Now I'm going to go ahead and I think I'm going to go for some of these other background things first. So that distant hill is actually pretty tricky and I'm going to make it um, big again so you all can paint along. That distant um, hill it, or the biggest hill is actually kind of tricky in the color. There are some green things on it, but it's mostly brown. So I'm actually just going to take a little bit of um, this Italian uh, or actually it's Monte Amiata. Um, burnt sienna monte amiata natural sienna and i'm going to so it's named after a mountain already it doesn't look like it's quite the right color match but i'm going to use that for this hill and one of the important things is to leave the buildings white and to make sure that the hill is quite a bit darker than the sky i'm not going to give away all my landscape painting secrets i do that in other videos or in my in-person classes. We'll try to just keep it quick here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this next hill up here because it doesn't touch. And the only reason why I'm doing that is because this watercolor is still wet. Yay, Sandy is here as well. Sandy was just on my recent um, Costa Rica trip. We just got back not that long ago. So that was a really fun trip. And this Andes to Amazon is sort of, was originally supposed to be like the more adventurous uh, counterpart to the Costa Rica Nature Journal beach vacation that we just had. But I have had to change some of the things in the itinerary and work with a, a, new, a new provider. And so that means that it's still going to be an adventure, but we're not going to be doing any camping or hiking with all of our supplies or anything like that. So it's still uh, it's still going to be like all really nice lodges. There's no there's no camping or hiking like originally planned, um, but in some other ways it'll be a little bit more of an adventure. I ended up doing the agave first, sort of a blue green color. Let me just make that a little bit bigger here. You can see a little bit of a blue green color. Oh, Sandra's here too. Sandra is going on the uh, Andes to Amazon trip. So we've got people from the last trip and people from the upcoming trip in the audience. And I think there's at least one person 
who went to the first one, uh, the Costa Rica one, is also going to the Andes to Amazon one. So that's super exciting to have some continuity there. Now I'm going to get my Serpentine Genuine and I'm going to do the foreground like I said I was going to before. And ideally, these should get darker and more saturated as you move towards the foreground. But remember, we're also just trying to get the basic idea. So um, you've got to keep this small and you've got to not worry too, too much about it. And you'll get better at landscapes. If you worry too much and you make them too big, you're never going to get better at landscapes. I'm jumping around a little bit just because it um, makes it faster for the watercolor drying. So now I'm going to actually jump back into this one back here that we put the, per the, the blue on originally. I just need to make that a little bit darker, but it should be lighter than this one that's in front of it. So I'm going to put a little bit of purple. Purple suggests distant land masses. Even if they don't look purple in real life, you'll be surprised you put purple on them and suddenly everybody thinks it's far away. Oh, I'm going to have to share this. So the agave you see in this picture is probably agave Americana, which a lot of people in Ecuador told me is native and or endemic to Ecuador. I don't actually think it is, and it's probably only been in Ecuador in the last 500 years. So that is since uh, Spaniards started um, sailing around and, and moving a lot of stuff and subjugating people in the new world. So um, the agave that Drew is talking about is in San Diego, not South Dakota, and is a very interesting endemic one to San Diego, California. Um, I've nature journaled it before and made some videos there before with uh, Drew's help. Um, he works at a really special place in San Diego. That's one of the few places where you can see that agave. It's a, it's a rare agave in the sense that it doesn't have a very wide distribution. Very different from this one that we're uh, looking at in the foreground here. Uh, might have to go by there. Thanks for the tip. Um, Drew's been a fan of the show for quite a few years and helped me get some Good nature journaling in down there at uh, Cabrillo. Oh, yay. Thea is here. Hi, Thea from Colorado. We did have at least one person from Colorado on our last nature journaling trip. Now I have to decide what colors I'm going to use for these other things and move on because some of you um, who are following along at home probably aren't talking as much as I am and you're probably ahead of me. Um, it always is slower when I'm talking, so I have a feeling some of you are probably chomping at the bit and ready to go to the next stage of this nature journaling adventure. Uh, what I'm going to do here with these buildings is I'm going to put a little bit of gray in, but I'm not going to, I'm going to leave most of it white. See how I, I did that? Sort of tricky. And I could do the similar thing for these clouds. And then I think the only other thing is I would like for this brown thing to be a little bit darker. Maybe it could actually put some green into it in a few places. It's too green. Something like that. That looks kind of bad, actually. Actually, that looks really bad. Let me show you how bad it is. Oh, I guess it's already kind of the camera's already kind of big on that. Okay, can we get a zoom in on that? Maybe we don't want to zoom in. Maybe it's time to go to the next thing. But you can see they're really basic. You could put some info there. Like um, I might just put, um, I'm just going to write towering agaves. This is going to be day one. It's, it's a dry forest. There's also going to be a good chance to see some cool tanagers, including some that spend some time in North America, potentially. Um, it is summer in North America while we're going to be in Ecuador. So you never know. Whoa, I'm almost running out of water. Don't forget to bring this on the nature journaling adventure in Ecuador. Let's see where we're going to next. Oh, you know what? Actually, there's a hummingbird that we're going to potentially see here. Get ready to sketch really quickly. 
believe it or not, this is a bromeliad that we are likely to see among many other bromeliads. And I filmed this hummingbird feeding at this bromeliad when I was in Ecuador the first time. This is actually in Quito in the botanical garden. So if you get there a day early, this is one of the places you can go. And let's just play that video again because it's – and this is not slow motion. I know it's sideways, but sometimes you have the nature journal sideways too. There are more types of hummingbird in Ecuador than any other place in the world. So if you like hummingbirds, get ready to nature journal them on this trip. Maybe I can pause it in a good spot. So this is a perfect time for you to be practicing your quick sketching. Um, even while I'm not doing anything, while I'm just sort of managing the controls over here, if you're an overachiever, you've probably already done a couple quick sketches. That's what I would be doing if I were just watching this as a participant, if I weren't the, the DJ, so to speak. Um, I would be trying to sketch all of this as quickly as possible. And that's really what I try to practice for nature journaling in the field, especially for nature journaling in information dense uh, environments such as tropical rainforests or tropical dry forests such as this. So if you want to get ready for this trip to Ecuador, uh, one great thing to do would be to practice drawing from videos, practice sketching really quickly, and just going out and nature journaling in real life, real animals as much as you can and trying to get get into the habit, get comfortable with making those drawings quickly. So just to show you how basic this could be, here you can see some of my quick sketches. I just got the shapes of the inflorescence. It's a Puya genus. You're going to have to just write, Marley said it's Puya because that's not something you directly observe. That's something someone told you. And then I did these quick sketches of the hummingbird, right? So let's go back and we'll, we'll watch this video a couple times. You can try nature journaling it from it as to the best of your ability. Oops. I'll try pausing it maybe a couple more times. Remember, sound is important too. And look at the position the bird is in right now. This is the kind of thing you... This is the difference between uh, science illustration and nature journaling. In real life, sometimes animals are in positions unlike what they come up. They, they don't show this position in the books, right? So it's good to practice these real life positions. And one of the ways you can do that is by watching videos online and pausing them. Don't worry, we're going to get to see more hummingbirds tonight. And some of them are going to be in slow motion unlike this one, but make sure you get a couple quick sketches in here. Oh, Adam is here too. Adam and Drew in the house. Wow, that's amazing. Um, this is a really cool species of plant and a really cool hummingbird. I'm actually blanking on which hummingbird species this is. It doesn't help that I've seen over a hundred species of hummingbirds in Ecuador, um, but I should know what this one is and I can't remember right now. So I do remember the genus of the plant is Puya. It's very cool bromeliad with these teal green flowers. There's not very many flowers in the plant kingdom this color, uh, and it's actually almost a subtropical. It can be grown in parts of uh, North America as well. Very cool plant, and we will be seeing these on that day one um, of the Nature Journaling Adventure. Notice the sound. Um, sound is something that people forget to nature journal. How would you describe that sound? Get a couple more quick sketches of this, and then we're going to move on because we've got 10 days. This is going to be a 10-day uh, nature journaling adventure. Don't judge yourself too hard. Remember, these could be your sacrificial pancakes um, coming out at first. So, um, you know, your first drawing of the day, if you haven't drawn at all, all day, if you haven't drawn it all in a month, if you haven't drawn it all in 30 years, don't judge yourself too harshly. Um, some people tell me, oh, I draw like a five-year-old. And then I ask them, well, when did you stop drawing? And they stopped drawing when they were five. So 
Um, no surprise that you draw like a five-year-old um, if you haven't drawn uh, uh, since then. Thea says it sounds like chirping. That would be a good, that would, that is a useful English word to describe the sound is, is rather chirp, chirping, chirpy-ish. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. So after day one, we've got day two, <laughs> majestic mountain. So these are, this is the Paramo. So um, we went to a dry forest already. I should write that down in my, my page. We went to a dry forest near Quito, and now there are um, mountains and Paramo. Um, P-A-R-A-M-O. And Paramo is a really interesting, not a forest, but a high altitude sort of grassland. In some ways, it's almost like heathland. And this is where we're going to go on the second day. This is our best chance for seeing Andean condors, one of the biggest flying birds in the Western Hemisphere, in the entire world, in fact, one of the biggest flying birds alive today and we have a good chance of seeing those as well as some other awesome birds but check this out the plants in the paramo are also super cool um, this foreground plant is amazing um, and i think it's actually in the blueberry there's a lot of things in the blueberry family which is really interesting and a lot of cool hummingbirds as well this is also where you can find the biggest hummingbird species in the world that's right, the biggest hummingbird. And it's it's like it would cover, its wingspan would cover my book right here. Um, not bigger than a skydiving ostrich. Oh, that's in terms of flying. Uh, yeah, that would, you'd have to uh, talk to the Ornithological Society about that, Adam. Uh, the, the hummingbird that's the biggest hummingbird in the world also lives in this area. So some major extremes here. Let's try to do a quick landscape here. Um, we've got some bird sketches in. We've got that first landscape sketch from the dry forest. Now we're in the Paramo and we've got another foreground element. Make sure you make your frame pretty small, um, especially if you felt overwhelmed maybe on the last one, make your frame even smaller. You can make it basically a thumbnail. Yay, Susan is here. So just to show you, Oops, oops, there we go. Just to show you how small mine is, is that's my landscape frame right there. I'm actually making it smaller than my last one. And yes, this is eye candy. Very beautiful landscape. Lots of volcanic stuff going on here. And a cool foreground plant. So let's go ahead and um, get a little landscape drawing of this. I'm going to do the foreground first with that plant. Um, the funny thing is I'm not remembering the scientific name, but I think the name in Ecuador is Chupiragua for this. They recently discovered a new species of hummingbird on a plant of this type, or at least this genus in Southern Ecuador. I think it was like five years ago. So relatively recently and on our, um, day two of the Andes Amazon nature journaling trip, we will get to see this and many more amazing sites. This photo was actually taken on a nature journaling trip that I co-led with John Muir Laws that was originally just going to be Galapagos, but then it had a um, Ecuador, continental Ecuador add-on with cloud forest, western cloud forest, and one day in the Paramo. He got sick on the second day with COVID. And this was a couple years ago when that stuff was um, more scary, I guess. And I ended up having to take over the trip um, until this day he rejoined our group. And I took this photo on that day. We're going to go to some of the same places from that same that trip, um, almost. But for the most part, we're going to be going starting in Quito and then going down the eastern side. So it's actually def co completely different parts of Ecuador. So I've got my basic drawing um, in right there. How hot is it in summer? This, uh, yeah, I know it does look a lot like a protea. I think it's actually Ericaceae though. Um, I, I, I naturalisted it and everything, but I just don't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, 
it is not in sandy is asking how hot is it in summer this area is not that hot except for in the sun it doesn't change that much so right now it's you know it's winter solstice in the northern hemisphere but this is basically zero degrees latitude and it doesn't change that much during the year the sun is especially at the high altitude the sun is really strong but i was cold and wearing a lot of layers if we go back to that last slide you can see those people are all pretty layered up um, because we're at one of the higher altitude locations but it will get warmer after that and warm in the sun um i will look up this species of flower later because i can't remember it right now i'm i'm definitely thinking it's ericaceae though um speaking of check out these three different plants there's a lot of oops we should do color on that last one sorry let's go back and do color quickly i'll show you what i've got for my quick sketch hopefully i'm staying caught up with you i know that when i'm talking i usually go slower see how i got this basic drawing in now it's just a matter of coloring it so as usual, I'm going to start with the sky, which should be the palest. I got a little bit of green in my blue, which is a big no-no. But look at the sky here. It's definitely, I didn't mess around with the saturation in this photo, I don't think. But that sky is very saturated. It's not always like, it's usually not like that. It might be because of the altitude. Um, I'm probably not even going to mess around with trying to show the clouds like that. That's um, a little bit too crazy. I'm just going to try to get close to the um, that intense blue. And I'm actually using phthalo blue, which I never use for skies. So that's one of the cool things on this trip is there's definitely be some extremes like these skies from the Andes are not normal. Okay, and then I'm gonna put it down blue into that volcano in the background. I can't remember which of the volcanoes it is, but that one in the background is definitely a volcano. And while that's drying, I'm gonna go ahead and do some of this foreground stuff, particularly the pale colors. So I'm gonna use this quinacridone gold for um, these grasses. The gra this, this species of grass is one of the characteristic species in the Paramo. And I'm actually going to use that quinacridone gold over all of this, and I'll paint some green over the crop land afterwards. So sometimes with watercolor, oops, that was still a little bit wet. You just need to work in sort of a, uh, almost like a Henry Ford type sequence because uh, once you have the once it's wet it's you can't work on things that are touching it so sometimes just doing everything on your page that has that color can be really good so for example while i'm waiting for that to dry i'm going to put that aqua green color that really cool aqua green color or teal color that the the um puya the puya species had on its flower because that's very um characteristic there's very few flowers in the world that have that color. I'll just do a couple swatches here. If you have a hair dryer, you could come in and do a little bit of drying. Put some orange in here for the flowers of the chupiragua. and some sort of dark green for the vegetative part. Oh man, it's only day, it's only day two. Save some energy, because this is a 10 day trip. Okay, I made that green way too dark, way too toned, it should be more saturated but i got some of the basics there now i'm going to go in with the serpentine genuine the green that i use the most and just kind of that's a little bit heavy i'm 
I'm going to try to imitate this sort of patchwork effect going on here. It's messy, but it's fast, and it sort of captures the idea. I didn't really capture the water, but that's uh, good enough. Let's go for like a 90% right here and just keep going. Also, to point out, there is an accent on Paramo over the A. Accents in Spanish just show the emphasis. So in this case, Paramo, it's the emphasis on the first syllable, Paramo. Cool. Look up Paramo on Wikipedia if you want to go for a fun, go down a fun rabbit hole. Um, we're going to be there for day two on the Nature Journal, um, this Nature Journaling adventure in the Ant from the Andes to the Amazon. Now check out these plants. Maybe we can get a quick sketch in. There's three different families here, very different families. And interestingly enough, at least two of these are well, um, well, represent, well represented in California as well, especially the one that's in the big photo. I was very surprised to find down there. And when I looked it up, it actually, I can't remember if it was actually the same species, definitely the same genus. It is indeed a Castalasia. So these ones are sometimes called Indian paintbrush um, in California. So if you want to get in a quick sketch of these three orange flowers, but all very different, lots of hummingbird pollination relationships up here in the Paramo, lots of cool, cool plants. Okay, so it looks like Adam looked up the plant um, that we were just drawing in the landscape and Chugiraga is, oh, so it sounds like the genus name comes from the common name and it's Asteraceae and endangered. Um, oh, that's a question. It, it could be, it sounds, it, it could, it could very well be. I would have to get into my iNaturalist to, to double check right now. Um, but it sounds, the genus based on the common name sounds about right. And Asteraceae would make sense because kind of like straw flowers. Um, and then this one, we've got the, we've got a couple cool ones here. So go ahead and if you want to get a quick sketch in, remember sometimes you have to draw plants quickly too. You can use words to describe them, um, even if you don't put colors. So like I'm gonna, you could say orange tips, for example. Got this other one. I can't, I want to say, I should have looked these all up before doing the video, but a lot of times when you're on trips like this, you don't know everything. And in nature in general, to go around assuming like we know everything is not really a great starting point anyways. So sometimes it's good to just be like, I have no idea what that is. But that one definitely was a Castalasia when I looked it up. And it obviously looks just like one. And then we've got a cool Crassulaceae. And I can't remember if it was a Dudlia, like the genus that we have in California or not. But a really cool type of succulent on the top right. All of these with orange flowers, all of these growing in the mountains around Quito. Um, and we will get to see all of these probably. And then day three, travel to the Amazon, but no, don't worry, we're not going on a bus. We're gonna fly. And that'll just make it a lot easier to get to the Amazon quicker. Most people don't like going on eight hour. Most people um, don't want to go on a eight hour bus ride. Oh, yay. Nancy's here. She's the one actually that, uh, suggested most people don't want to go on an eight hour bus ride through the foothills of the Andes, looking at all the landslides and windy roads, watching, um, uh, terrible Vin Diesel movies. The Fast and the Furious seems to be one of the most popular movies that they play on buses in Ecuador. So we're going to fly instead, and guess what? We're going to fly into Coca, um, also known as Francisco de Orellana, 
And um, in that town, uh, on our way to the Amazon, it is technically an Amazonian. We're going to go to a market. So um, if you want to nature journal in a market um, full of all kinds of amazing, amazing crops, because agrobiodiversity is part of biodiversity too, this will be a great chance. This photo was actually taken in Puyo, which is in a different part of the Ecuadorian Amazon but similar vibe to the market in Coca, I'm assuming. Um, I didn't, I don't have any pictures right here to show you of the palm weevil larvae um, that is also available in these markets. And you will have a chance to eat palm beetle larvae if you come on the trip. Um, so be prepared to sketch in a situation like this. Yes, I asked these ladies if I could take a photo of their booth. Um, notice how she did her hair up especially for the photo in like three seconds. So um, I did ask permission. Um, we will be going on a canoe ride to get to after the plane trip, after visiting the market, we'll be going on a, plan, uh, a canoe ride um, to get to our lodge where we're going to be from day four until day six. And this is the Waita Lodge. These are photos um, from Nancy. Nancy's in the chat, by the way. Um, Cybugs is her company. And uh, Nancy's collaborating and doing all of the entomology and logistics and is our official guide on this trip. And she has a lot of experience with this lodge. So I'm really excited to be based from here. If this looks like something you'd want to do, you could definitely include sketches of the lodge into your nature journal. Some people did that on the recent Costa Rica trip as well. Uh, I don't want to say too much about these because there's a chance we won't see them. You never know. Nature is is fickle, of course, but we might as well do a quick sketch. So um, I am going to try to get a quick sketch in. Um, Sandy's asking about the temperature. I don't know. I think it's probably, the temperature is probably going to be less than where we were in Costa Rica, but the humidity will be higher. So the um, perceived temperature might be higher and i think that nancy has a bunch of the uh um the logistical information on the temperatures and all the stuff i haven't been to this part of ecuador before this part of the ecuadorian amazon um near cuyabeno uh it's actually that's part of why i'm really excited nancy recommended this location partly because we can see we have an opportunity to look for things such as the pink river dolphins which you can't see um, easily in other parts. So I'm just going to try to get a quick sketch. I'm usually not a big fan of mammals, but I mean, come on, it's a endangered aquatic freshwater dolphin. I mean, how, how cooler can it be than that? Swimming in Lipton tea. Um, I'm going to write Lipton tea next to my drawing. And just a quick, really quick drawing there. I'll show you my drawing real quick. Um, you can see just a basic, I don't think, ah, maybe, you know, this would be fun to paint with actual, actual tea. Um, but I don't have actual tea on hand right now. So what I'm going to do is I'll just do a quick wash and just do it over the whole thing. And I'm going to mix a little bit of like a, a reddish brownish color and just paint over the whole thing like that. Boom, done. All right. Why the orange color? Those would be tannins. So um, you can have a lot of fun. One of the recommended readings for this trip is going to be the Neotropical Companion. I think it might be a Neotropical Companion. Even if you're not coming on this trip, I highly recommend it. It talks about the difference between all of the South American tributaries and major um, rivers and why they're different colors. But um, some of them are more basic and some of them are more acidic. Some of them carry sediments from the Andes and some of them don't. And in this case, this river is mostly carrying tannins, which is a secondary uh, secondary plant compound. Mostly, uh, it mostly uses a defense compound. Um, there's a whole uh, a whole basic like. Uh, you could call it a, a arms race between plants and insects mostly that has led plants to develop a lot of different chemical defenses and tannins, just like in tea 
and in red wine, tannins are a defense compound. Um, let's go on to the next thing here. So hopefully you got a quick sketch of that. And there is another fascinating aquatic mammal, very unique to Amazonia, and that would be the giant otters. I've seen the neotropical otters before in Ecuador. I have not seen the Amazonian one. So this is a challenging thing to draw, but go ahead and try to give it a quick sketch um, if you want. And once again, keeping your drawing small is a great trick especially when you can't see that many details of something or when you don't feel confident about drawing something, draw it as small as you can and it will probably come out better. The front face on version of mammals is always harder. So this will include monkeys, which we might run into as well, which can be a lot of people are afraid of drawing monkeys. Yes, these are the... Um, Oh, yay, Margot is already reading that book. That is great. Um, well, Nancy might have some recommendations on um, books that are good about Ecuador wildlife. I will try to think of a few more recommended books. Um, but if you read The Neotropical Companion, and I think if you read um, another one I really like that's not specific about Ecuador is... Um, the Song of the Dodo is about island biogeography. It's super interesting. And I'll try to think of a few more. Nancy might know some. These are really big. These are the ones. There was a famous um, Snoop Dogg video where he narrated a nature video of these fighting jaguars and crocodilians. So, um, ooh, here we go. Here's a, here's a book recommendation from Nancy. Thanks, Nancy, for joining in. Nancy has put together an amazing itinerary. And the entire website, ooh, good time to mention the website. The entire website was built by Nancy. So you can just go over here, actually, and I'll put it in the um, I'll put it in the comments too. But this website is amazing. It's dedicated to this trip. And it has, in, not only does it has an entire itinerary, it has tons more information. Um, it's incredible. Um, you can get like all the information you need and you can sign up for the trip right there. And there's actually only two spots left. So some people on the trip are already here um, and on, watching the show right now. And if you're interested or you know someone who is, uh, send them the website because it's great. And you can get everything you need right there. All right, so bye-bye otters. There are other vertebrates there as well. So don't forget Ecuador is also one of the top most biodiverse countries for fish, fishes. And these are all, I basically copied, I, I copied all of these photos, a bunch of these photos right off of Nancy's website. So it's either her photo or one of her client's photos from one of her previous trips. Don't worry, you don't have to swim if you don't want to. But there is an opportunity to go on, uh, do some fishing, learn about local fishing practices. And one of the things that I recommended, for example, on our recent Costa Rica trip is that if you're anywhere, if you're nature journaling near water and there are people fishing, always go over because... One of the great things is when people are fishing, they might pull something out and you can um, nature journal it. So I did a quick sketch of that piranha there. Um, I looked up the iNaturalist for this region. And if you if you look up, if you know how to use iNaturalist, you can create a boundary box around a specific region and see what's um, what people have observed there. And it's absolutely insane for this region the number of things that, that come up. There's at least two piranha species. Um, there's a ton of different monkeys. Um, it's super biodiverse. Um, speaking of mammals, uh, there are three-toed sloths. Um, it's not actually my favorite mammal. I know everyone will be mad that I said that. Uh, we do have the chance of seeing this. I'm not going to slow down to draw this one, but if we find one on the Amazon while we're at the Waita Lodge, um, don't worry, we'll definitely stop and you can draw it then, but let's just keep moving on for right now.
there are a ton of birds, um, ridiculous amount of birds. These are all photos from Merlin, but these are all species that I have personally observed in the, the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, we've got the Amazon Kingfisher, correctly named as extremely large Kingfisher of the Amazon region. Um, I think that's the crimson hooded tanager and Lafin, Lafin somebody's piculet. Piculets are like really small uh, woodpeckers. Super cute. It's kind of ridiculous when you see it. You won't believe that it's real. Go ahead and get a quick sketch of a couple of these birds if you want. We are going to have more birds in a second because there are more hummingbirds coming up. But notice the toes, one thing that would be interesting to notice is the toes on that piculet are zygodactyl. They have two going forward, two going backwards, which is characteristic of uh, woodpecker relatives. That gives you sort of the, um, you can understand a little bit of the phylogeny or the taxonomy of this and why it is a woodpecker because of that. There are some other species of birds, other taxa of birds that have zygodactyl toes as well. Um, toucans, interestingly, which we'll also see, are also zygodactyl. Okay, hopefully you got a quick sketch of the piculet, the tanager, or the kingfisher because we're going to move on. And just so you know, oh yeah, Hawatsons. We probably will see Hawatsons. Yay, Michael is here. Um, Michael just came back. I don't think he wears the eye patch like that in real life. Um, uh, great guy. He was on the Costa Rica Nature Journal Beach vacation as well. Um, Hawatsons, I should have put a picture in here of those. Hawatsons are an absolutely crazy bird. Um, definitely read about them on Wikipedia or somewhere else because that is a fun rabbit hole to go down. They are a very trippy bird um, with a weird smell. Um, is probably one of the reasons why they have not been overhunted by, by humans. Um, and they nest on the ground and a lot of really weird stuff about them. So uh, uh, I saw them for the first time in the Ecuadorian Amazon as well. Okay, I said I'm not a huge fan of mammals, but monkeys are a highlight for a lot of people. And check out these I think these are marmoset. These are type of marmosets. I looked these up on iNaturalist. Um, the credit there is is on there somewhere. It's very small, but I think it was like somebody Torres on iNaturalist. If you look up on iNaturalist in the region where we're going to, you can see all the species that are there. And that's what I did to find this marmoset. So let's do a couple quick um, sketches of these. There's a whole bunch of other monkeys in the area as well. Um, hopefully we don't see too many because I think they're actually really hard to draw for most people. Um, but remember, it's not about making a pretty picture every time. It's about trying to like record the information in your nature journal. So for example, the image on the left, I would try to capture it as a sort of scene, uh, make like a boundary box and get the plants in there as well, because these animals aren't floating in white space separate from their ecosystem. And even if you can't see the head of one of them, that's fine. That's how they are in nature and try to just draw what you do see. So if you see like a mass of fur, you see a, a spiral of a tail, try to just draw that. You only see one face. That's fine. Try to just draw that. And let's just sketch these for, for a little bit here. And remember, you can use your words to add information to a drawing. If you can't complete a drawing or there's, there's certain things you aren't able to capture with the drawing, try putting a few words next to it. Sandy and Michael are here. There's at least two people here that were on the Costa, recent Costa Rica trip. Uh-oh, Eva is trying to call me out on not liking. People got really mad when I say I didn't like whales, so I'm a little bit hesitant to say I don't like sloths that much. So let's set this up to see a little bit bigger my drawing. 
um, you can see I just did a really um, basic frame right here. So I did this first, like I tried to draw a face, and then I did this. Boundary boxes are extremely powerful. So especially when you aren't really confident about what you're drawing or you just want to keep it limited, um, putting this boundary box around it is really helpful. And it also allows me to do, watch what I'm going to do next. So this is this group of marmosets. I'm pretty sure they're marmosets on the left um, is, is a rather challenging subject. So um, one thing that can be really helpful is just kind of capturing the context a little bit and letting that take some of the pressure off of the drawing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to do a bunch of this green around this mass of monkeys. And this is going to happen to you almost anywhere you draw animals is they're going to be in these masses sometimes. They're, they're not going to be perfectly separated out like on a field guide. They're going to be clumped up together. I think that's its butt, but I'm not sure. Um, they're going to be clumped up together like this. And this happened in Tanzania on the safari as well. Um, and so being able to draw these clusters of animals is really useful. And just by, check out how easy that was. Just, just by um, painting that green around it, it kind of gives this sense. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just write uh, cuddle puddle marmoset. I'm going to put that in quotations too because I'm not totally confident on that. Marmoset cuddle puddle. All right, so as far as taking lots of art supplies, some people on the Costa Rica trip had a whole suitcase full of art supplies, which was maybe a little bit much, but um, all right, let's go to the next thing. I think we're still going to be, oh yeah, here we go. So what are we going to do at night? Well, there are a ton of amazing bugs. And we're definitely going to be setting up some lights at night to see what we can attract. This is from um, more of a cloud forest location on the west side of Ecuador. Um, but we will definitely see a lot of bugs and have a chance in Nature Journal them at night. Here is a cool moth that I saw. This is also um, more on the western slopes of the Andes in Ecuador. Um, but we will find some similar ones. So let's start drawing this one. I'm actually going to have to fill up my water brush really quickly because it ran out of water. But while I'm doing that, feel free to start sketching this one. I thought this was one of the coolest moths I've ever seen. This is why you should always carry at least two water brushes full of water when you're nature journaling in the field. Uh oh, what? I don't get it. Please explain. I'm not going to talk smack about no felines. Are you kidding me? There's a big difference between a sloth and a jaguar rundi or an ocelot. Okay, so here I'm going to just go for this moth. Remember, they have bilateral symmetry. So if you want to cheat, you could just draw one side and then you could write same on the other side or something like that. Also notice the antennae have a comb-like structure. There's cool technical names for all of those kind of entomological features that Nancy's going to be able to drop a bunch of entomological uh, wisdom on us during the trip. Hopefully you like bugs already. If you don't like invertebrates already, this trip could be a really good way to, to learn to love them because look how cute they can be. And you will probably be with a group of people that are pretty into bugs already, pretty into nerding out on nature already. Plumos, there you go, feather-like. 
So go ahead and add that to your vocabulary list for the day, plumos and tinny. And how about the colors on this thing are amazing. Okay, so maybe that was a typo from Sandra. Sandra is probably coming on this trip as far as I know, but hopefully more people won't fill up the remaining places before she does. Okay, so now I'm gonna get this yellow in first. Remember yellow is like the least powerful hue. Everything else contaminates it really easy. Let me make mine a little bit bigger so you can see how I do this here. So I'm gonna start with that yellow. It looks like mine is a little bit too, at least on the camera, it's looking, there we go, that's a little bit better. It was like too cool of a yellow and it's actually more of a warm yellow when I look at it again, or am I tripping? Maybe it is a cool yellow. You'll learn a lot about colors on this trip. Um, I will basically be available as I was on the Costa Rica trip to answer all kinds of questions about nature journaling technique, watercolor, what media is best in really humid conditions. You know, our watercolor might be an issue when we're in the Amazon. Um, it can become an issue. What are some other approaches? And we'll be doing and learning about all of that stuff on this trip. So um, don't worry if, if you feel like you don't know enough about watercolor or different media or nature journaling, we'll be covering all of that a lot. And I kind of feel like I need some kind of like blue color in here. Well, what's that piece of trash? Some kind of crazy blue. So I'm just going to get a teeny bit of this phthalo blue. This is probably a bad idea, but let's see if I can just put a little phthalo blue in up there. All right, happy accidents. Okay, time to move on. Look at that. If you didn't like the di diurnal lepidoptera, I mean the nocturnal lepidoptera, maybe you'll like the diurnal. And this one looks completely fake, but I guarantee you this is a real, real butterfly that I photographed in Yasuni on the Amazonian side of Ecuador. Um, and this was... Um, absolutely crazy. I know it looks fake. It looks like a sticker, but there are, if you do not like, oh, it's a moth too. Oh, well, well, it's still Lepidoptera. And uh, if you don't like the moths um, and other, you know, more creepy crawly end of the invertebrates, um, there's definitely some of these um, pretty butterflies for you to enjoy as well. Um, also, if you're more into the weird stuff and the relationships, which I think relationships are the most interesting thing. Let's sketch this right here because this is absolutely crazy. I saw this on the Amazonian side of Ecuador, not where we're going to be exactly, but this is a relationship between a fungus and an insect. Um, so uh, super cool. Let's try to at least get a basic sketch of this. This is something I found on a night walk and we will have an opportunity to do some night walks. So just pretend like you're out on a night walk, you got your headlamp on. There's probably going to be some bugs buzzing around your headlamp. That is one of the downsides of having a light right in front of your face when a lot of um, a lot of organisms use light to navigate with and they fly straight towards it. But um, this was on a night walk. Just imagine you're out there. you got your headlamp on. You've got your nature journal kit. There's probably some drops of humidity or rain falling from the canopy above. There's a ton of cool cicada noises. The, the air is pretty warm, even though it's nighttime, it's humid, the stars are amazing. And we're out here looking for frogs, we're out here looking for bugs, and we find a leaf with this trippy mystery connected to it. Some of you probably have some ideas about what this mystery is. And remember, with Nature Journal, we can ask questions, we can study things like this and, and let our curiosity really explore and come up with lots of questions and, and use our critical thinking and our observation. Ooh, here's an interesting question. 
Um, I think that it is faster, faster, cheaper, and more portable. Um, it since it dries fast, I can get color on a page like this really quickly. Um, I would have to carry um, a thousand colored pencils to match the number of colors that I just use on this page. Um, Thea is asking, why is watercolor always recommended? This teeny little palette right here, I can basically create infinite colors with this. And with uh, water brush technology, it can do all that standing up. So that is definitely a huge, huge benefit for uh, nature journaling in the field. However, what I've noticed is that if you're in any situation with high humidity, this can just turn into a mess and your page doesn't um, dry fast enough. In extremely high humidity situations, I think that um, a waterproof paper like right in the rain combined with colored pencils, um, it, a limited range of colored pencils can actually be better. If you're working at home in the studio, I'd say whatever works well for you. It doesn't have to be watercolor. It could be colored pencil. Um, you know, like for example, um, Michael, who's here right now, is using a lot of watercolor pencil, colored pencil, pastels, and other techniques for nature journaling. Um, watercolor is mostly recommended, I think, for practical reasons. It's small, compact, and it dries quickly compared to um, um, oil and stuff. Uh, we're on day four through, uh, Eva just asked if we're still on day three. <laughs> I think we're on day four through um four through six still so let's find out there we go day seven so day four through six is going to be at Waita lodge in the amazon just to make sure you know if one day it's raining really hard um or something like that just to make sure there's a lot that we can see on the amazonian part um, but day seven we're going to be leaving and no we're not going to take the bus we are going to be taking a short um flight and day seven, we're going to be just, you're not going to believe this, but there are hot springs. Um, there are amazing hot springs in Ecuador as well. And right by them, there's some amazing Paramo and some other really cool transitional forest that we're going to get to see. This is another photo from Nancy's website. You can see Nancy there in the middle with the pink boots. 30-minute um, flight, not bad at all. We're going to get it, go up to this amazing, um, amazing lodge up here at the Papa Yakta, very famous hot springs. Um, if you want at this point in the trip to get a massage or something like that, um, that will be available. And there's also cool plants and birds um, around the hot springs as well. Um, did I miss it? I, somehow I went straight to day nine. I might be missing something in there. But um, we're going to transition from Papa Yakta to the cloud nearby cloud forest um, right before everybody has to leave. This is a, I believe this is the golden crested Quetzal that I saw um, in a nearby area of Ecuador. Um, and we have a chance to see a lot of really cool birds here. So I don't, just like with the um, pink dolphins, I don't want to guarantee that we're going to see the sword-billed hummingbird, but the sword-billed hummingbird is the only bird in the entire world whose beak is longer than its entire body or something like that. So it's a very, very special, unusual hummingbird um, that we have a chance to see. So might as well get a sketch of that right now because this is the kind of uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to see something like that. And I have not seen these yet. So I would be very, very excited. Um, if I get, if I cry on this trip, if we see one of these, um, please forgive me. I'm going to do a quick sketch of it now from this photo from the Merlin app. And if you've never used the Merlin app for birding, um, I will be giving some lessons on that as well on this trip. Um, I, I talked about how to use it some um, on the, the recent Costa Rica trip. I was trying to draw like a, there we go. A little comic version of myself being very excited next to this.
Day eight is Papa Yakta in the landscapes. Right. Okay. So day seven. Oh, there we go. That's what it is. Day seven, we left. And this one should be day eight, Papa Yakta in the expansive landscapes. Day nine, Misty Mountains, Cloud Forest. Uh, Sandy, you can check out the website. I mean, you could probably ask a question here, but you could also check out the website and Nancy's info is on there. And my info is on there. Um, and, uh, Nancy has great answers to all the logistical stuff. And I have answers to the stuff about the, the nature journaling content. Good question, Sandy. So I got a little sketch in of that hummingbird. Sorry, I, I switched around there a little bit. That's how it's gonna be though in real life, y'all, is it's gonna be a little bit ADD. There's gonna be animals everywhere. There's gonna be birds everywhere. There's gonna be so many things. Um, I will work really hard, and this is what I did on the Costa Rica trip to, to try to help you um, stay focused on what your goals are and get as much nature journaling out of it as possible. If I notice you're just kind of walking around with your eyes popping out of your head and not nature journaling at all, I'll try to provide some tips for um, how to keep your eyes from popping out of your head too much and how to keep your pen on your paper. So you'll notice there's also a really cool sylph over here. That's a um, long, I think this is the long-tailed sylph. We could even see these in, in Quito. In, in the city of Quito as well in the parks. And then there's also an Inca Jay or Green Jay down here as well. Um, just absolutely ridiculous. Um, two other birds that are almost guaranteed that we can see. Um, those sylphs are, are very common actually, a fascinating bird. Um, and um, it's fine if you did some quick sketches of these, but let's get on to this because I've got a video right here. Are you ready? This is a slow-mo video that I took in the cloud forest with some hummingbirds at a feeder. So might as well start sketching that one that's at the feeder. Ooh, look at that one that just arrived with those white boots there. Love the lightsaber sounds. So try to just get some gesture sketches in of these these hummers. Or write down what you notice. I notice a bee or something that looks like a bee. What is the posture? What's the basic hummingbird posture? If you like hummingbirds, it's gonna be a really good trip for you. Let's play that again. What do you notice? Do you see anything going on in the background? Chasing? If you like stingless bees, this is a good trip for you also. <laughs> I love stingless bees. Yeah, listen to those sounds. They totally sound, when the hummingbirds are on slow motion, they totally sound like lightsabers. I just saw two chasing each other in the background. Try drawing them really small sometimes. That's a good technique. I love the sound in slow motion videos. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you got some sketches there. I'll show you what mine look like. Maybe that'll make you feel better. Um, hopefully. <laughs> See how mine are pretty quick sketches. I also use some arrows. Look how goofy this one looks. But, you know, just trying to get these shapes in is really good practice because there's going to be a lot of hummingbirds on this trip. All right, what's next? Let's go back to here. Oops. Orchids. Ecuador has more orchid species than any country in the world, at least according to the Ecuadorian orchidologists. 
Um, there's an amazing orchid collection in Quito. If you have an extra day, um, like if you want to add on to the trip, um, an extra day at the beginning or an extra day at the end, talk to Nancy and she can set you up. Um, the, the orchid, um, collection is right in Quito. It's, it's freaking amazing. You could spend a lifetime nature journaling in there and, um, we'll hopefully see some, um, in the wild as well. They can be a little bit tricky. They're not always flowering. There's definitely seasonality to it and depends on where in the country you are. If you're really into drawing orchids, um, there might be something in the future completely focused on drawing orchids. Um, and uh, that will be announced later. Um, it would probably would be in Ecuador. Um, but yeah, just if that's something that you're interested in, there might be a trip completely dedicated to drawing and nature journaling uh, orchids and potentially with some canopy access in it as well. Um, yay, thanks for joining, Gene. I know we're getting we're past the hour mark now. And it is day 10, the last day. So everybody, this is this would be the last day of the Andes to Amazon trip. There's a bunch of things you can do when you reach the end of a virtual adventure or when you reach the end of a um, real life adventure. And um, on the recent nature journaling trip in Costa Rica, on our last day, I gave a bunch of tips and techniques for how to fill your pages, what kind of homework you can do to add to your pages, to complete your pages, maybe add some color at the end. And um, it was really, that was a really great part of it. And that's what we would be doing on this last day. Some people are going to have um, early flights. Um, some people might have later flights. Depending on how much time we have, we could go to the orchid collection. We could go to the vivarium. I know the woman who runs the vivarium. They have a bunch of really cool snakes and frogs and stuff like that. So to, we could go to some of the historic centers and draw the old buildings and the markets and things like that, the, the churches. And so depending on people's flights, day 10 could um, be really mellow or maybe we'll add in some stuff in Quito. So um, thanks to everybody who joined. A bunch of people who joined in tonight were on the Costa Rica trip. Um, a bunch of people who um, joined in for the virtual are on the real life Andes to Amazon trip. And remember, you can find out more um, at this website right here. I don't think you can click on it or copy and paste it from there, but I'll put I'll put it into the comments as well. Um, and uh, definitely check out the website. You can see the full itinerary. You can see the the costs. Uh, two, I think it's um, two thousand seven hundred and fifty is the basic cost um, for the trip. And that includes in-country flights and everything. All you need to do is get to Quito, Ecuador. I've also been researching um, a couple different uh, of these websites that, and uh, a couple of these different websites that have super cheap flight announcements. And so if, as I learn about um, good deals for flights to Ecuador for next summer, I will let you know. Um, definitely check out the website. That's the best place um, to stay updated because at this point there are only, I think there's only two spots left. So um, sign up soon. Uh, you got to sign up before January 8th to go on this actual trip. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining in on this virtual adventure. Um, enjoy the holiday. The next episode of the Nature Journal show is probably going to be the season finale. So I'm going to put together I haven't done this in over a year, but I'm going to put together an edit, super time consuming edit, edit showing a bunch of funny um, clips and exciting clips from the whole uh, season three. So um, that is coming up next Wednesday. Enjoy the holidays. Enjoy the solstice, everybody. Bye.